Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, down in Australia, Gilmore Space became the first Australian company to launch a rocket intended to go to space. Their Eros rocket had big ambitions, but unfortunately their flight was very small. It, it took off and uh, soon after it went down under. It didn't explode in a big fireball though, and there's an interesting reason for that. But uh, yeah, their rocket is the Ares. It's about 25 meters tall, maybe about 35 tons, and it's supposed to put, you know, maybe of the order of 100 kilograms into the low Earth orbit. And it's a three-stage rocket, and the first two stages of that use yeah, hybrid rockets, right? So now, hybrids are sort of, they're half liquid, half solid. So the liquid rockets that are on, say, the Delta IV, they have, uh, like, hydrogen and oxygen, and you feed these into the rocket engine, and you get thrust. The Atlas V, it has these strap-on solid rocket motors around the outside, and these are sort of nice. The military love them because you can just sort of shift these things around, and you handle them. They're pretty much inert until you need to fire them. They're very power dense uh, and they're very easy to handle but uh, the problem is once you start firing them you can't turn them off so a hybrid rocket is a mixture of both you have the sort of solid section with a channel down the middle the solid section will typically have your propellant and then you have an oxidizer which flows into this at sufficient temperature that the, the, the fuel starts burning with the help of the oxidizer. At the bottom, of course, you have like a throat and then you have your nozzle and you basically have a rocket engine. And the advantage of this is you get solid rocket motor like handling capabilities and densities, but you also have the ability to throttle them, to turn them on and off, although it's hard to turn them back on again after you've uh, fired them once or twice. So anyway, the Eris rocket has four of these in their first stage of their rocket, right? These are like cylinders, again, I don't know how, exactly how many, but you can see four of these and they're not exactly densely packed. The fuel is fairly dense and actually leaves a lot of space in the rocket. In front of that, there is a large hydrogen peroxide tank. This is a fuel or an oxidizer that when you pass it over a heated catalyst, it breaks down into oxygen and water at high temperatures. And according to Gilmore, the temperatures are sufficiently high that when you then pass that hot oxygen through the fuel, the fuel will then burn and that's what you get, that's where you get your thrust. So the first stage has four of these. The second stage only has one of these. These are called Sirius, by the way, that's their internal code name slash model name. And the third stage has a more traditional Phoenix, uh, oxygen, kerosene, you know, liquid rocket motor, and that will get them into their final orbit. And the, uh, you know, Gilmore, they had been sort of setting expectations, saying that they would be very happy if they got a few seconds flight and they didn't destroy their ground uh, infrastructure. And it mostly looks like they got a few seconds flight and they didn't destroy their ground infrastructure. But we didn't see any live coverage. The only live coverage that happened was from a fan, uh, Aussie Knot, who was live streaming from down okay, there. We're going. And we're going. Uh, he was so we're excited going. he it's managed going. to knock the it's camera going. away from going. the launch a few seconds into the flight. But thankfully, we did get oh, okay. good uh, shots hovering. later. I, I honestly think the Aussie Knot footage gone. is just... It's good gone. because it's exciting to hear a local you know, oh, Australian no. proud of their country it's and gone. enjoying the moment and it. yeah then coping um, with the, the failure afterwards. Straight off the pad. But then anyway, we using the official footage sufficient. what we can see is they got like about 14 seconds worth of flight the engines light up for a good few seconds beforehand they stabilize and then lifts off and initially uh, it accelerates and based on my measurements you know counting pixels knowing the height of the rocket it looks like it accelerated to about 20 kilometers per hour in a couple of seconds and then one of the engines stops producing thrust it stops producing those nice uh, like mark diamonds right and that means that you've only got three engines and it looks like that pretty much balances the thrust exactly. So it sort of continues upwards without accelerating at this point with three of the engines burning. The third one has fire coming out of it, but it's not sufficiently high pr pressure that it's producing any significant thrust. Now, of course, the rocket itself, because it's lost one of the engines, it's now like a chair that's missing a leg and it starts to sort of pitch over. 
Well, the first stage also has an attitude control system. Now, remember I said that these four motors have fixed nozzles? Uh, the attitude control system are these hydrogen peroxide thrusters. So again, you can just take your hydrogen peroxide, run over a catalyst, and you get fairly hot, high energy steam and oxygen. And you could just expand that out a rocket nozzle and you get, have a monopropellant. And this is great because you can turn it on and off quickly. There's a bunch of spacecraft that use hydrogen peroxide reaction control thrusters. So anyway, these thrusters, they point sideways. So as the rocket starts to pitch over to the side, they have to push this in. And that means that they keep it vertically and it stays vertical throughout all of this. Mad props to the guidance team for making this happen. However, because they're pushing sideways at the bottom, the rocket starts to drift sideways away from the pad. And thankfully, it drifts over into a field rather than anything that was uh, had potential hardware that could be damaged in it. So anyway, uh, about maybe eight seconds into the flight, a second motor then fails. And at that point, it goes from having a thrust to weight ratio of about one to having probably a thrust to weight ratio of about 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So it begins to decelerate downwards at 0.3 g. It lands more or less upright, but because it's going sideways, it then falls over. And most people at that point would expect an ear-shattering kaboom. But, you know, solid rocket motors, again, you haven't got the fuel and the oxidizer mixed in a way that really lends itself to a big explosion. Certainly the the tanks, the propellant tanks had to be pressurized, those might pop open and start leaking and hydrogen peroxide at you know, high concentrations is nasty, it will set everything on fire, but it's not going to, you know, get into the engines and mix itself with the fuel very rapidly and cause a big explosion. So they largely had a fire and honestly, looking at the video, it seems to me they might have actually had the engines continue firing for a little while when they were still on the ground. But it, then eventually there was some more big fireballs and things like that. But it wasn't like a massive uh, explosion or anything. So anyway, what I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm trying to figure out what could have led to this. So you have this single hydrogen peroxide tank that's feeding all this stuff. That tank must have been good because it was delivering good pressure to initially four of the engines, then three of the engines, and then two of the engines and the attitude control system. So they didn't have a leak there. They would have had to have individual control valves for each of these. Now they might have had a failure there. Uh, I, I saw one source that said they use pumps to actually pressurize the hydrogen peroxide. It's possible that one of these pumps failed and then another one failed. Now these engines, they've been doing a lot of tests. There's a lot of great footage showing them actually firing these things on the side on the ground. So presumably they've got a lot of experience knowing what they, they need to get these things firing. But the fact that they have two failing very, very quickly does raise some concerns. This rocket, by the way, it's been sitting around for like a year or so. Once you build these hybrid rocket motors and you put them inside that first stage, I'm not sure how easy it is to change them out. So if they ever test fire at this stage, they couldn't test fire it because once you test fire it, you know your propellant is in these solid rocket motors. And the only way to refuel your stage is to take these motors out and to put new ones in. And I'm not sure how intimately uh, mated these things are with the rest of the structure where they can actually change these motors after the first stage is assembled. So there could be a pump failure. You know, when you've been fueling and, and practicing with a hydrogen peroxide, there could be things that get corroded. Maybe this sat around for too long after having hydrogen peroxide introduced into the system. They could have had valve failures, but you know, valves, of course, they had to open them up to get the fuel flowing. And it might be that they were set up to fail closed and they had like an electrical power button and uh, the valves closed and you had very limited flow there. One thing I did notice is that in all their tests, the ones I've seen footage of, they as they shut them down, there is a small amount of flame, but it does seem to go out very quickly. Whereas for this flight, there did seem to be a sort of continuous flame sputtering out of that motor, leading me to believe that there may have been some flow continuing. So this might not have been a valve closure. It might have been like a pump underperformance. The other possibility that I'm sort of thinking about is that when you have a hydrogen peroxide catalyst, it's possible 
that you can actually flood the catalyst and it stops decomposing and then you're now flowing the hydrogen peroxide through the engine and it's maybe not decomposing quickly enough to get the combustion levels it needs and that could also be an issue so there's like a bunch of different things that could have affected the amount of uh, the way the the hydrogen peroxide is flowing through this engine and we're not sure which one it could be another thing to consider is that all the tests they showed of their serious rocket motors they were sitting on their side and this was firing in a vertical position and it's possible that with this thing sitting vertically that there's some components that behave slightly differently that happens with fluids so it's possible that there's some relationship there that might be worth investigating but it does look like the software was working fine because they kept the thing flying upright they like the thing stayed under control it's literally it's something to do with these the the way the hydrogen peroxide is flowing into these engines and I'm sure that we'll have Gilmore do like their research. I mean, they posted some video this morning. Uh, they posted their official video. There's also a drone video they posted. They, they claim some level of success saying that, yeah, they got 23 seconds of engine burn time, which is small compared to many of their other tests. They lifted off. They cleared the tower. They got to an altitude of maybe 35 meters. And, uh, you know, they didn't kill anyone, which is a good thing. So, yeah... Uh, this was a fascinating launch to watch. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that we will see some like official response from uh, Gilmore going forwards because I'd like to know uh, you know what their findings are. So look, you know, great to see Gilmore Space getting off the ground. I'm glad that you feel that you've had some sort of success. I hope that you're excited to go on and try to launch again, solve this problem, and it would be fantastic to see Gilmore launching into space. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.